Thanks again for joining us in these Sunset Streaming Studies. Our current study is on prayer, and the series is entitled Draw Near, Grasping God's Gift of Prayer, where the emphasis really is on grasping, to, to know it, to know prayer as a gift from God, and to really have a deeper understanding and application of prayer for us. In our last lesson, we were looking at the principles of prayer. And we looked at four principles that, that, that should guide the attitude we have in back of our prayer. Uh, the, the principle of faith and the principle of humility, the principle of harmony and of thanksgiving. And how those attributes, those characteristics or attitudes, if you will, need to really drive the way we pray and, and how we pray. In this lesson, I would like for us to look at a couple other principles that are, that are very profound uh, and extremely important if we're to understand uh, this, uh, this privilege we have to pray and the power that is given to us in prayer, uh, not only seeing the, uh, the power but the purpose in prayer and, and to motivate us to greater persistence or consistency in our prayers. And so tonight, our, in this lesson, what we want to look at is the principle of praying in Jesus' name and praying in the Spirit. Praying in, in Jesus and praying in His Holy Spirit. Two, uh, two principles that are instructed in regards to our prayer life. And so I invite you to turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 8. This is, this is a, a popular passage for us because we know Romans chapter 8 verse 28 that, um, that has become well known to us. For we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. And so we, we look at that verse and we think that you know God is doing everything for our good the way we define good and and we take that out of context and when we look at the rest of the chapter we'll see how prayer helps us in discerning how God is at work in our lives and so if you'll if you look at Romans chapter 8 and in verse 15 and 16, Paul says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified by him. He goes through this uh, discussion of the sufferings that we face. And he says there that, that the sufferings we face now are not worthy to be compared to the glories that are awaiting us. And so in verse 26 he says, in the same way. If verse 25 says, if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we eagerly await for it. In the same way, verse 26, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So there's a great deal to learn about prayer. But before we get to that, we need to understand that we pray in the name of Jesus. That's how Jesus um, taught his disciples to pray. In John chapter 14 and in verses 13 and 14, He's explaining to the disciples about his departure and 
uh, how he is going to return to the Father, but he's going to send a helper to them. In verse 13, he says, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus, therefore, is instructing us that what we pray is in the name of Jesus. Now, one of the things we have to understand, we can't take this out of context. Of course, if you take just verse 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And therefore, we take this blanket statement that, that anything we ask of God, we say in the name of Jesus, and God gives it to us. And then we get frustrated. We get disappointed. We become discouraged, disillusioned. Um, when, when those things don't happen because we take one little verse out of context. And so anytime you and I are trying to understand the meaning of a verse for us today, number one, we need to see who is speaking. We need to know who that person is speaking to. We need to know what they're saying. We need to know the context in which they're speaking this. And we need to know when they're saying that, that that should happen. And so Jesus is the one speaking, and he's speaking to the apostles. Chapters uh, 13, 14, 15, 16 are all this uh, exchange with the apostles. It's all about the, his explanation of returning to the Father. Of course, you know in, in John chapter 13, he's washing the disciples' feet at the Last Supper. He's telling them to love each other and, and do the same for each other. And in chapter 14, he begins to tell them that he's going away. You know the place to where I'm going. Uh, Philip says, we don't know where you're going. How do we know how to get there? Jesus says, well, how long have I been with you so long that you don't know me? And so they say, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so in talking about returning to the Father, he says, you know, I go to pr prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. When I go, I'll also come and take you to where I am. And so he's, he's talking to the apostles, and he's talking about the oneness that he has with the Father and about their work in establishing the church, as we will read in Acts chapter 1 and following. And so, uh, and then he'll talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of the apostles. And he will do things for the apostles that he doesn't necessarily do for everybody else today. Once that purpose was, was fulfilled or accomplished, there was no need for the Spirit to do today what he was doing for them in the first century. And so within that context, Jesus says to the apostles, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so there's this principle that applies that when we are praying, when we are asking for things, when we want God to, to act on our behalf, that we pray in Jesus' name. Of course, that's how Paul commanded the, the, the Christians in Ephesus to pray. If you look at, at Ephesians chapter 5, you will see in verse uh, 20, well, in yes, in verse 20, he says that they're always giving thanks for all things, giving thanks for all things, that's the good and the bad, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says that Praying needs to be done in the name of Jesus. And so we ask ourselves, what, is, what does that mean? What does that sound like in the name of Jesus associated with our, with our prayers? Well, it means more than simply adding the phrase, in Jesus' name, to the end of a prayer. Sometimes I wonder if we think, if I, if I think or you think, that when, when we add, in Jesus' name, amen, that that in itself ensures that God hears our prayers and that because we have said, in Jesus' name, he will respond 
to our prayers. That if we pray, if we say in the name of Jesus, that we're guaranteed to get what we want. John 14 and verse 14. In our last lesson, we looked at Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, where Jesus says, you can, you can tell the mountain to jump into the sea and it'll be done. And he says, he says, whatever you ask, believing, you will receive it. And so as we, as we look at the idea of praying in Jesus' name, it, it, it's, not, it's not some magical incantation that we add to our prayers to make sure everything works right. Uh, uh, of course, in, within the first century, in the history of, of the church and its infancy and the establishment of that, and in the culture, the Roman culture in which it grew, we see that there were a lot of pagan deities and, they, and there were a lot of pagan practices where people would, would say things um, and, and use specific words. It, the book of Ephesians refers to the Ephesia Grammata, which, uh, which seeks to appeal to or appease the gods. And so that's not what Jesus' name means in our prayer. When we pray in Jesus' name, we recognize that he is our only means to approach God in prayer. In John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. In Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 18, Paul says that we both, that is Jew and Gentile, have our access through him in one spirit to the Father. We'll look at the spirit in a moment. But we have our access to God through Christ. It is in his name that we can access God. In fact, in, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, if you read verses 19 through 22, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so this is the way we have into that holy place. And so the writer gives us the, uh, the imagery of the tabernacle under the old covenant or the temple uh, in, after Solomon's time and how the high priest would serve and would go into the Holy of Holies one day out of the year to make atonement for himself and for the nation of Israel. And, and he was the only one allowed in there. He is the high priest. And so the writer says, since we have a great priest or high priest, over the house of God. In other words, it's only the high priest that can go in. And so there's this imagery of Jesus walking us inside that veil, which the Hebrew writer says was his flesh. He has given us access. And so we have confidence to enter the holy place. As I've said before, there are places that we can go where we don't have confidence to be. Uh, I, I used the analogy of me watching a baseball game from the dugout. I, I don't have confidence to enter the dugout because I know that if I walk into that dugout, somebody's going to come, take hold of me, and haul me out of there because I don't belong there. I'm not allowed there. And such was the case with the Jews under the Old Covenant. They could not enter into that holy place. Only the high priest could enter once a year. And so, in other words they could not enter into the immediate presence of God on their own. Only the priests could enter in there for them, on their 
behalf. And so Jesus gives us a new and a living way, a life-giving way into the presence of God. Of course, chapter 4 and verse 16 of Hebrews tells us that we draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we might receive mercy and might find grace to help in time of need. And so when we enter into that most holy place, we look for mercy. And in fact, within the most holy place in the tabernacle was the mercy seat, was the throne of God. And so we can enter in there in the name of Jesus, only because he has granted us access into that holy place. And because of that, we can pray in Jesus' name. We can recognize him as our high priest who, according to Hebrews 7, 24 and 25, says that he lives to make intercession for us. So he's interceding with us in heaven. The Holy Spirit is interceding for us while we're here on earth. And so that brings us to this point of praying in the Spirit. This is a concept that is, has been misconstrued greatly in our day. Um, and so one of the things that we need to understand is how the Holy Spirit dwells within us. If the Holy Spirit does not dwell within us, we cannot pray in the Spirit. So follow me on this thinking. This, the indwelling of the, of the Holy Spirit within the hearts of Christians is something that was promised. Acts chapter 2 and verse 39. This promise is for you. What was promised? Well, Peter says in verse 38 that if you repent and when you are baptized into the name of Jesus Christ, you'll receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And so the, the, the Spirit dwelling within us is a promise that is made by God fulfilled by him when we are baptized into Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 says that the love of God is poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given. He will give us the Holy Spirit and he has given the Holy Spirit to the Christians in Rome and he describes that as the love of God being poured out. In Romans chapter 8 and in verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. In verse 11, but if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Through his Spirit, who dwells in you. And so we have the Spirit that dwells in us, that tells us we belong to Christ. We have the Spirit who dwells in us, who will give life to our mortal bodies. And so that's because the Spirit dwells within us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 tells us that we are a temple of God and that His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us. In Galatians chapter 4 and in verse 6, we're told that God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, by which we cry, Abba, Father. We hear, uh, we hear much the same uh, that we see in Romans chapter 8 and verse 15, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, we're told that we're sealed, uh, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Acts 2 and verse 39, this promise is for you. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge, uh, given as a pledge. And, and he guarantees our ultimate eternal redemption. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 14, Paul instructs this young preacher to guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure that was entrusted to him. 
And so this Holy Spirit dwells in us. In James chapter 4 and verse 5, we're told that God jealously desires the spirit that he made to dwell within us. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of Christians is a, is a spiritual reality. It's one of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says we have all spiritual blessings in Christ. And this is but one of those tremendous blessings that the Spirit dwells within us. And since He dwells within us, then we can pray in the Spirit as the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. In fact, in, in the book of Jude, it's a very short book. It is one chapter. It is the, it's the book right uh, before the Revelation. And in Jude verse 20, he says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. He speaks to them as praying in the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 18, Paul would say much the same thing. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And so we're, we're told on two occasions, on one occasion, we're told what the people were doing. They were praying in the Spirit, Jude verse 20. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, they were instructed to pray in the Spirit with all perseverance. I, it reminds me of Jesus taking his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he would be arrested. And, and as he, uh, he leaves the, the, the majority of the apostles to pray in the garden, and then he takes Peter, James, and John a little bit further with him, and he leaves them at a place about a stone's throw from where he would go, and he, he tells them to pray that you don't fall into temptation. He told, he, they needed to persevere in that prayer. But of course we know they fell asleep three times as Jesus went to pray. We see the persistence of Jesus' prayer, but we also see the lack of persistence on the part of the apostles. And so Peter, or I'm sorry, Paul says, with all prayer and petition, Pray at all times in the Spirit. And so he recognizes that our access, Ephesians 2 and verse 18, that we have access to God through him in the Spirit. And so we pray at all times in the Spirit, which simply means that we live in the reality that the Holy Spirit is our constant help in prayer that he is interceding for us in prayer. It, is, it, is, it does not mean that we pray in this some kind of um, ecstatic, euphoric condition um, with, with a language that, is, that we consider to be heavenly or angelic. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, as if angels speak in a different language than men. Now, every time I read in the Bible of angels speaking, they're always speaking the language that man speaks. And so every time that's recorded, the language of angels and men, I would, I would think would be the same language. There's, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels... And so there, there's this, un, this uh, common understanding today that, that in order to pray in the Spirit, you have to be able to pray in this ecstatic condition or this euphoric experience um, and, and use different tongues to speak. And that's, not what, that's not what Paul is saying. But praying in the Spirit 
is to really realize, to recognize the spiritual reality that the Spirit dwells within us and He intercedes with us, that He comes to help us in our prayers. We'll see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. It is in Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16 that tells us that we've received the spirit of adoption. In other words, that the attitude, in contrast to the spirit of slavery to sin, we have the, adopt, the spirit of adoption. It's, it's an awareness that we have been adopted as sons. We are children of God, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The idea of, of Abba, Father, which speaks which speaks to the personal uh, relationship and the knowledge we have of the Father. Mark records Jesus crying out, Abba, Father, in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, we've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. That is, slavery to sin and to evil. But we've received a spirit of adoption. In other words, we are now God's child. We are a child of God, and it is because of that we can cry out, Abba. It, it's, it's as if a child finds himself in trouble, and he cries out, Daddy, Daddy, save me, help me. And it's, that, it's only because the child has that personal connection, that intimacy with his father. And then, of course, we cry out, Abba, Father, which gives a little more substance to the one to whom we're speaking. He's not simply daddy upstairs. He is Abba, a personal father. He is our father. And that's why Jesus introduces this concept. What's interesting to note is that in Judaism, prior to Jesus, they did not address God as father. He was, he was addressed as God, as Jehovah. And, and they would not uh, refer to him as father in their prayers until Jesus taught that we should pray this way. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Our Father who is in heaven. And so Jesus introduces the fact that we call him father because we've been adopted as his children. Therefore, there is this personal relationship that allows us to call him father and gives greater dignity than just calling him daddy. And so there's a great deal of respect in calling him father. Abba, father. And then he says the spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. He confirms that for us, that we are children of God, that, that we are adopted as children and that we are born as his children. We are born again as Jesus would, would describe with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that a man must be born again. He must be born of water and the Spirit. And so we're born into this relationship and we're adopted as his sons. He gave us the right, John chapter 1, to become children of God. And so it's because of that relationship, the adoption as sons, that we can cry out, Abba, Father that we might look forward to being glorified with him. And so verses 26 and 27 of Romans chapter 8 gives us such great encouragement when we pray. Because we don't all often know what to pray for. We don't know the words to use. We don't know what requests to make. Uh, we don't know the best outcome. Now we might think we do, but we don't. And we need to realize that. And we need to realize that it is then when the Spirit intercedes for us. And so he says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so one of the things that we've recognized in the privilege of prayer it is, is that it is God's children who have the privilege to pray to him as father. That privilege is not available to everybody and anybody. It is available to the children of God. And so he says he intercedes for the saints 
in verse 26 he says that the spirit helps in our weakness he intercedes for us in other words us are the saints the saints are us and so that's that's who the inner the spirit intercedes in behalf of and so there's three things that he that he really does that he helps us he intercedes for us because he knows the heart of man and so please don't take this out of the context of suffering or don't don't forget that this was written in the context of suffering remember who is writing to whom they're writing and the circumstances surrounding the writing. And so he's talking about suffering. In verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be con compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also set free from its slavery to, to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we also ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. He's looking at the ultimate and eternal redemption that is guaranteed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit from Ephesians 1 verse 13 and 14. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we eagerly wait for it. And so within this idea of suffering, the, su the, the Christians undoubtedly suffered greatly in the province, the, pro the Roman provinces, uh, and in the city of Rome itself. There was a great deal of persecution that was taking place. You can look at the histories and see what Nero was doing to the Christians. And, and so there was a great deal of suffering that took place then. But Paul says it's not worthy to compare to the glory that awaits us, to the glory of heaven. What an encouragement that is. And so he says in verse 26, in the same way. So in the context of suffering, in the context of weakness, which in the Greek is a singular word. It's not weaknesses. It is our weakness. The Spirit also helps our weakness in the same way. And so these three words, he helps, he intercedes, and he knows. He helps because he takes hold of the weakness. And that's, that's what the word means when he says he helps us in our weakness. It means that you take hold of something that another person has, you lift it with them to carry it because they can't carry it themselves. Oftentimes we use this when, when we're moving. Um, when, when I moved here uh, to Taylor, Michigan. We had a number of people that helped us load our truck in California and people that helped us unload it and take it into our home. Uh, we took our, uh, our, all of our furniture and, and one person would grab one end and another person would grab another end. He was helping us. Just That's the idea of what the Holy Spirit does when he's helping us in prayer. He is sharing that burden or carrying that load. He is coming to our aid. Why? Because we don't know, the New American Standard says, how to pray as we ought. Literally, it means we don't know for what we should be praying. We don't know the words. We don't know the needs. We don't know what the best outcome would be. And so... The Spirit intercedes for us because God knows our heart. We'll talk about that. And so the, the Spirit intercedes and conveys that to God. And so we may not know what's most needful for any given situation, but we know that God does. And we know that His Spirit does. And since we know that His Spirit is dwelling within us, we know that His Spirit is not just there 
reclining on the couch, napping for the rest of our lives. No, the Holy Spirit is within us to work on our behalf, to come to our aid, to help us. That's what was promised by God. And so oftentimes we see situations or circumstances from such a limited perspective. In fact, we, we see most things in the immediate context, in the here and now. We don't see the, the long-term effects or the outcomes, the ultimate outcomes of whatever we might be facing in our weakness, in our, maybe in our suffering. And so we need somebody who can see that with a bigger perspective. Um, and, and nobody has a bigger perspective on things than God does. As we've mentioned earlier, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 pleaded with God three times that God would remove that thorn in the flesh. But God would say, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, perhaps, was looking at the immediate context. He was looking at his own comfort, his own abilities. Um, the thorn in the flesh was given to him so that he might talk about the visions, or so that, that it would keep him from speaking about the visions that he had seen. And so perhaps Paul's desire was that that thorn be removed so that he could then talk about the visions and explain those visions that he had seen. But God, looking at the big picture, says, no, that thorn is okay. I know it's not comfortable for you, but my grace is sufficient for you. And so I'll see you through this with my grace. My spirit is there to help as you're praying. And, and so every time as God, as Paul was praying that God would remove that thorn, the spirit was interceding for him because he knew what was best. And God knew what was best. And God saw the future. God saw the big picture and said, My grace is sufficient to see you through this. So Paul knew of the presence of God, even in the midst of his own struggles. And that's one of the ways we see the help of the Holy Spirit, is that he is present even when we struggle, even in our weakness. And so he helps us by interceding for us, which simply refers to one who turns to, um, who approaches or makes an appeal or petition to somebody on behalf of somebody else. And, and so um, one of the ways that I've seen this in my own life is when I was a kid and I would want something from my parents if, if I was in trouble and if I was being punished, I knew the likelihood of getting something or getting to go somewhere or do something was very unlikely because I was in trouble. I was punished. I was their child, and they wanted what was best for me, and sometimes what was best was that punishment. Now, I didn't, I didn't think so at the time, but in hindsight, I can see that. And so if, if I wanted something, sometimes I would have one of my brothers ask for me. And I would say, why don't you ask mom and dad for us and we can do that. Maybe they weren't in trouble like I was. Or maybe I should turn this whole example around. But, but we would ask the other to talk to mom and dad to see if we could get what we wanted. And so they were interceding for us. And oftentimes, we do this. We do this in relationships. We do this at work. We do it at school. We do it in all kinds of places. Why don't you talk to them for me? Why don't you ask them for me? And what we're doing is asking them to intercede. That's the idea of interceding, making an appeal or a petition, approaching someone on behalf of another. Our Holy Spirit approaches God he makes our appeal to God. He petitions God on our behalf. He offers the requests that we would offer if we knew what to ask, if we knew the right words, if we had the words to say. He offers the requests that we would offer. And one of the things that is so encouraging is that the, the phrase, He intercedes for us, is, is written in the present text. 
And so, which means, or the present tense, which means that it is a continuous action, that he is always interceding, that whenever it's needed, the Spirit intercedes for us. And he says, with groanings, too deep for words, the, these groanings, they, they're yearnings, they're, it's, it's sighing. And, and literally, it says unutterable. Groanings too deep for words. Groanings that are unutterable in verse, at the end of verse 26. And so, the Spirit intercedes not with, <clears throat> not with words from some unknown heavenly language, but he responds with no words at all. These, these are thoughts that are unutterable. These, he, he responds with the sigh, with the yearning, with the yearnings that we have. And he communicates that with God. From the heart, he says, he, he intercedes for us, and he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So we see that the Spirit helps us by interceding because he's in our hearts. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. He's poured the Spirit into our hearts by which we cry, Abba, Father. And so God's, God is the one who searches the heart. God knows our hearts. That ought to be an awakening thought right there. But then God knows and, and it's as if he approves of what the Spirit conveys from our heart. God approves the Spirit's petition that comes from our hearts. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 3 he says, And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Again, that context of suffering and hardship. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so the Spirit is, is within us. He's in our heart. He's in our mind. He's, in, he's the very center of our being. And, and he communicates with God that which we can't see, that which we can't say which we don't understand, which, which we don't know what would be best. But he says, again, back to verse eight, or, uh, chapter 8 and verse 27, he says he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God in harmony with the Father's will. And there we are back with the principle of harmony. And so we see these principles, faith and, and humility and harmony, thanksgiving, the name of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. It is always in harmony with the Father's will. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, is not going to present to, God, to the Father something that is not in harmony with his will, because that's just not going to be done. So he does it according to God, according to the will of God. And so we have the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us and he intercedes for us because he knows our hearts and our minds. There's a song that we sing that was written in 1992 by Stephen Curtis Chapman. And it asks questions but then also provides answers. And he says, how do you explain? How do you describe a love that goes from east to west? and runs as deep as it is wide. You know all our hopes. You know all our fears. And words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. If words could fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand years, Lord, I would still run out of time. If you listen to my heart, every beat will say, thank you for the life, thank you for the truth, thank you for the way. So listen to our hearts. 
hear our spirits sing. A song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love. So listen to our hearts. So what we've seen here in the principles of prayer, we, we've examined that, that we're to pray in faith. We're to pray with humility. We're to pray in harmony with the will of God. In our prayers, we are to give thanks for all things. We are to pray in the name of Jesus, recognizing that it's only because of him that we can approach God as our Father, as a child. We are to pray in the Spirit, who dwells in us and intercedes for us. But bottom line, we are to pray. We are to be a praying people to express that dependence that we have on God. We cannot overestimate the value of the Word of God in these principles. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Humility is learned by reading the Word of God. Read Psalm 119. Knowing the will of God is impossible without the Word of God. And thanksgiving is easier when we understand the blessings we have described by the Word of God and the importance of having Jesus as our High Priest revealed in the Word of God. So with the Word of God to guide and to aid us in observing all of these principles of prayer, then you and I are so much better equipped to make prayer truly meaningful and, and a beneficial experience in our lives, to be more devoted to prayer, more consistent in our prayer, more dependent in our prayer, and we'll be more inclined to employ the principle of persistence in our prayers. Well, that'll be the subject for our next lesson. May you be blessed by knowing that Jesus has given you access to the Father, that he has enabled you to be born and adopted as a child of God, to which we can, to, we can cry out, Abba, Father, giving us that personal relationship. Know that, and know that his Holy Spirit lives within you. He's given to you when you're baptized into his name. That's God's promise. And dwelling within us, he intercedes on our behalf, especially in the times of struggle, times of weakness. Be, be assured that God knows your heart when you pray. May you be strengthened in prayer. We'll see you next time.